Hello and welcome to our second talk of the Wonder Kids lecture series. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're just thrilled to have you with us. Uh, my name is Sav Naibur and I'm research manager in the Early Development Research Group at UBC. Also helping out today is Vera Mueller, our wonderful recruitment coordinator, and also Rachel Drew, uh, who is a PhD student in the Center for Infant Cognition. Uh, Dr. Hamlin, along with her amazing trainees at the Center for Infant Cognition, studies the development of moral and social behavior in infants, and her center is one of six that make up the Early Development Research Group. Because most of the research that Kylie will tell you about today took place on campus at the University of British Columbia, I would like to acknowledge that our campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. But of course, this is a virtual event. You can see that we're all uh, at home and uh, I think Rachel's on the island. <laughs> and so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of the many lands that you might be joining us from both near and far. <clears throat> So I will introduce Kylie in just a moment and she will speak for about 30 minutes and then afterwards she will answer your questions, uh, taking us to about two o'clock. Do feel free to pop in and out of the webinar as you need. We understand that most of you have little tots at home. To gather your questions, we'll be using the Q&A window that you may access using the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, throughout the talk, feel free to submit your questions as they as they come to you, and also you can upvote questions that others have submitted that uh, that you would also like to have answered. If you are unable to stay for the entire talk or maybe have some technical issues, uh, don't worry, we will be posting this recording on the EDRG website over the next couple of days. All right, so I am just delighted to introduce to you Dr. Kylie Hamlin today. She is Professor and Canada Research Chair in Developmental Psychology at UBC. She joined the UBC Early Development Research Group in 2010, immediately upon receiving her PhD at Yale. She has been conducting award-winning research on infant cognition ever since. She has received the Stanton Prize, the Rising Star Award, and the Killen Research Prize, among other awards, and she is a member of the Royal Society of Canada College of New Scholars. She is known for being an immensely active and productive scholar, not only publishing frequently in developmental psychology's top journals, but also being a uh, serving as an editorial board member for cognitive development, infancy, and scientific reports. If she looks familiar to you, uh, you may recognize her from the recent Netflix series, Babies, in which she and her work were prominently featured. If you haven't had a chance yet to check out that series on Netflix, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, so without further ado, please join me, although we can't hear you, uh, but I believe you're joining me in welcoming uh, Dr. Kylie Hamlin. Thank you, Sav. Um, what a lovely introduction. Um, thank you all for being here. And I'm just going to start out by saying that my own toddler is in the background, unable to understand why I am locked in my office on a Saturday, not paying attention to her. So if there's um, some screaming in the background, you will know why. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, so infants grow up absolutely surrounded by people. This set of photos is um, just a small number of the many, many people that Eliza interacted with during her first year. Some of them were primary caregivers like myself. Um, others were her siblings, um, our friends, and many, many, many perfect strangers. Um, of course, we didn't tend to photograph her interactions with perfect strangers, but they did occur. So not only are infants constantly surrounded by people, but they, of course, depend on people for their very survival, right? Um, thankfully, babies have various tools in their toolkits to get us to care for them, like being able to cry, um, looking extremely adorable, et cetera, et cetera. But these observations sort of of the pervasive and critical nature of early social relationships um, have led developmental psychologists, including myself, um, to ask what mechanisms might exist within infants themselves to support effective social interactions. Okay, so what mechanisms are there that support infants' social relationships? Well, even from birth, infants prefer social stimuli versus non-social stimuli, and indeed they prefer particular kinds of social stimuli over others. So here is just a sort of summary picture of some of this work in developmental psychology, basically suggesting that infants across the board prefer more social stimuli to less social stimuli. For example, they prefer 
human voices versus non-human voices. They prefer um, uh, the scent of their mother versus of another uh, stranger. They prefer the human face versus non-face configurations. And they prefer to look at human movement versus non-human movement. Just to sort of give you an idea of what these kinds of studies look like in a newborn, this was a study done all the way back in 1975 with infants just a few minutes old. And essentially um, paddles were held up in front of newborn's faces and they were moved around their head. Um, and sometimes these paddles had configurations like on the left lower picture, um, faces and face-like configurations. And sometimes the paddles had things more like the right lower picture, um, which were scrambled versions of faces or upside down facial configurations. And basically what, it was, what was found is that newborns even a few minutes old would preferentially turn their heads to track the human or the faces rather than the non-faces. A recent study came out suggesting that preferential attention to faces might even be present prior to birth. Um, so using 4D ultrasound, we're now able to look at how fetuses choose to turn their heads rather than uh, babies outside the womb. And it turns out that you can shine light inside the uh, uterus that fetuses can then see. And fetuses have been shown to preferentially turn their head toward um, configurations of light that look like a face rather than configurations of light that don't look like a face. Okay, suggesting that by birth or even earlier, infants are preferentially attending to the social stimuli that they come across. These early social orienting responses are thought to be largely reflexive and sort of low level, but potentially sort of um, underlaid by subcortical brain areas. For neurotypical infants, these uh, mechanisms that are largely reflexive are thought to be replaced by intentional volitional processes um, sort of cortical controlled uh, brain uh, areas within two-ish months after birth, okay? Okay, so what we also know that from early in the first year, infants also appear to understand things about social others. So they not only preferentially orient to them, they seem to understand them. And in particular, they seem to understand that social partners are agents who have goals and other kinds of mental states. So how might we ask whether an infant understands that someone has a goal? Well, here's a very classic study in this domain. Infants are shown a human hand reaching in toward one object over another. In this case, the human hand reaches in and touches the ball and ignores the bear um, over and over and over again. So we habituate babies to this kind of display or make them really bored with it. The reason that we do that is then we switch things about the display and we see what kinds of things they notice, okay? And the kinds of things that they notice are those that they tend to look longer at. And based on what they look longer at, we can make some inferences about how they're perceiving what we show them. Okay, so babies are habituated to say this hand grabbing the ball. And then babies are shown two different kinds of events once they're bored with the hand grabbing the ball situation. The location of the toys are switched and the hand either switches their goal, so reaches in the very same way, but toward a new goal, the bear in this case, or the objects are switched and the hand changes the direction of its movement and, um, but reaches toward the very same goal. So we call these sort of new goal events where the hand changes its goal or new location events when the hand changes its pattern of motion, essentially. And what we find is that Infants um, from three to five months of age look longer at changes in goals than they do at changes in movements, suggesting that they're thinking about agents' actions in terms of their goals, right? So it's not interesting when someone keeps the same old intention, but switches how they do it. It is interesting when people seem to switch what their goals are or what their mental states are, okay? So critically, this effect has been shown to be specific to the actions of agents. So it isn't the case that infants think any old object touching something else is a goal-directed action. If you show them a non-agent, like a stick in this case, touching a ball over and over and over again, and then the location of the objects are switched and now the stick touches the bear, um, babies don't look longer at that. 
Okay. So they only look longer at changes in goals when um, it's an agent that is doing the actions. So they also seem to treat others um, as agents, even if they aren't human. And the reason I bring this up is because um, a lot of the studies I'm going to show you don't use human actors. They use um, sort of little puppet characters or cartoons. And it turns out that infants like adults seem to be willing to attribute agency and goals to non-human entities. So in these kinds of cartoon-like displays, babies are shown like little ball characters who seem to move around like agents. Maybe they have a face, maybe they don't. Um, and it turns out that if you habituate babies to agents acting in particular ways, like for example, jumping over a barrier to get to their goal, um, then if you show infants later events where the barrier is missing or changed in some way, infants will look longer when agents seem to keep pursuing their goal in what is now a sort of inefficient or costly manner, right? If there's no barrier there anymore, you should just travel straight on to your goal. Or if it's a little barrier, you should only jump a little rather than a lot. Um, studies like these suggest that by just six months of age, infants expect agents to pursue their goals efficiently or rationally, um, basically by minimizing costs. Um, and they're surprised when they do otherwise, or they look longer when they do otherwise. Okay, so it seems like infants demonstrate selective social behavior from birth, sort of preferentially attending to the social world versus the non-social world, and to some social agents over others. And in addition, they interpret agents' actions in terms of mental states. So the work that I'm going to show you today and the work that we do in the Center for Infant Cognition asks whether infants see some kinds of goals and some kinds of agents as better than others. Particularly, we ask whether infants understand social goals, for example, intending to help versus harm others or pro-social and anti-social actions and individuals. Okay, so here's how we study this in our center. We basically show infants a number of shows. Typically they're live puppet shows, although um, during COVID we've had to scramble and, and do more things on screens and online, et cetera. Um, but your typical visit to the, to the center would involve a live puppet show. In these puppet shows, there's always three characters. There's a protagonist who has some kind of unfulfilled goal. Um, and then there's a helper who helps the protagonist get his goal and a hinderer who help, who prevents the protagonist from getting his goal. So we think the helper is sort of a pro-social character um, and a hinderer is an anti-social character. We show infants helping and hindering events over and over again until they're nice and bored with it, until they're habituated. This is sort of our, just a measure of learning in babies. So basically when they choose to stop looking, we think, okay, they've gotten everything they're gonna get out of these shows. And importantly, we counterbalance or randomize a lot of things. So um, some babies see like the orange shirted puppet be the helper, some babies see the green shirted puppet be the helper, um, some babies see helping go first, some babies see helping go second, some babies see helping on the right, some babies see helping on the left. Um, we do this because we wanna make sure that these sort of lower level variables are not um, what we're measuring. We wanna make sure we're zeroing in on the sort of higher level social behaviors that um, differentiate these characters. Okay, so I'm going to show you some of our shows, um, and they look something like this. This little character will try but fail to get to the top of this hill. And in this case, the yellow character is the helper, and the helper pushes the climber to the top of the hill. Next time he tries to get up the hill, A, in this case, hinderer character, the blue character comes and pushes him down. So that is our hill puppet show. Um, our ball show looks something like this. So here the protagonist was playing with his ball, he dropped it. 
um, another guy picked it up and then um, the protagonist sort of asks for it back by opening up his little arms and is uh, the helper gives him the ball back. On other kinds of events, when the protagonist loses his ball and asks for it back, the hinderer puppet runs away with the ball, sort of stealing it. Okay, so here's our box show. In this case, the protagonist is going to jump on the box and try to open it. You can't see it very well, but there's a brightly colored rattle inside the box that presumably this character is trying to get. The helper opens the box. And the hinderer closes the box. Okay, so these are obviously very different shows, but they all have the main idea that there's a helper and a hinderer of a protagonist's unfulfilled goal. Okay, so now I'm just going to show you how we assess infants reactions to these events. Um, in particular, we see which character infants like better when we give them the forced choice between the two. So when infants watch the Hill show, they get brought the characters over on a board. And we see, simply see which one that they touch first. When infants are presented with hand puppets, we make sure that they look at both puppets before their choice because in general, they just really like hand puppets and so tend to reach for whatever they see first. Um, but if we make sure they've looked at both before we present the puppets, we um, see some more sort of careful choosing. Um, so that was a nine month old. Here's a five month old baby. Okay, so um, five month olds also um, produce reaches for puppets. So we measure which one they touch first. Here is an 11 month old. Okay, um, so um, of course we don't get a, a ton of hugging and kissing of our puppets, but it does um, happen and we count that as a choice as well. Okay, so for babies under about five months of age, we don't observe reliable reaches from them. Um, indeed, babies just physically cannot reach until they're about four and a half months old. Um, so with younger babies, we show them um, basically both characters side by side, and we just hold them there for 30 seconds. And then we measure the number of seconds that they look at each puppet and take relative looking as a measure of their preference. Okay, so this is a graph that's going to have just a lot of um, data on it. Each set of bars is going to be an individual study that we've done. Um, and on the y-axis is just the percentage of babies who preferred either the pro-social puppet in blue or the anti-social puppet in purple. So um, across the bottom, you can see that these were all um, different kinds of sh different shows that we show them, all the three different shows I showed you in the beginning. And basically age decreases as you go along the um, x-axis here. Um, so this is just a pretty large smattering of data from our center. And as you can see, there is a lot more blue on the graph than there is purple. So um, it's not the case in every study and it's not the case for every baby, of course. Um, indeed, we only get one choice out of each baby who comes into the center. And there are many different things about the characters that they might evaluate, right? Some babies maybe just really love blue and the puppet who was not nice happened to be blue that day or something like that. Um, but as you can see on average, we're finding more babies are preferring the pro-social characters to the anti-social characters. Really interesting to me is that we don't observe any difference depending on the show that we show babies, nor depending on the age of the babies. So three month old babies who aren't even old enough to reach yet are showing sort of basically the same level of preference for pro-social puppets as 10 month old babies are. So just to give you a bit of a summary, there's about 400 babies on this graph and about 75% of them preferred or touched or looked at the pro-social puppet. Um, 
there was a recent meta-analysis of labs sort of from all over the world who are doing similar kinds of studies. And what um, the meta-analysis observed is about a two-thirds preference for helpers versus hinderers. Um, so not quite as high as what we've observed in our lab. Um, however, uh, we did sort of design these studies initially. And so, you know, maybe uh, we're just doing them uh, slightly differently than other labs are. But thankfully, it's we observe that it's not only babies in Vancouver, but babies um, potentially other places as well tend to prefer uh, pro-social puppets. OK. So really, the, the bulk of the work that we're currently doing um, and have been doing for some time is not sort of do babies prefer helpers to hinderers, because we think that they do as a group, um, but sort of asking why that is. So what is it that they're noticing about helping versus hindering? So one possibility is maybe babies come into the center having seen lots of helpful actions in their life. And so they find harmful actions surprising and so aversive in some way. Well, we don't think that's the case because the classic way to ask in the infancy literature about whether babies find something surprising is whether they look longer at it. So in this case, we can ask whether babies find hindering events surprising by asking whether they look longer at them. And they don't. So at no age group have we observed that infants look longer at hindering versus helping. And indeed, how long babies look at these events doesn't uh, predict their own choices. So it isn't like some babies find hindering surprising, they look longer at it, and then those are the babies that prefer helpers. Um, basically, they don't look longer at one versus the other. They seem to find them equally interesting or equally uninteresting. One possibility, though, is that perhaps what we're observing is not a really a social response at all, um, but there's just something inherent to the kinds of actions that we've shown babies that are helpful versus the kinds of actions that we've shown babies that are unhelpful. So, for example, maybe infants just like pushing things up hills versus pushing things down hills, or open boxes versus closed boxes, um, etc. So. We don't think this is the case either, because in each of the studies we've done, we've also brought infants into the, to the center to look at matched sort of what we call control conditions, where the helper and hinderer, sort of um, quote unquote helper and hinderer, do the same physical actions, but they do it to non-agents. So they do it to objects like a red ball being pushed up to a hill or down a hill, or a stick that holds a ball <clears throat> getting the ball given back to it or taken away. And what we find is that in none of these cases where the same actions are being directed toward an inanimate thing who's not sort of worthy of being helped and hindered, do babies prefer helpers? Okay, so why do babies prefer helpers? Well, anecdotally, it looks emotional. Um, as we're sitting there showing babies these puppet shows and measuring their looking time and measuring their um, reactions, <clears throat> it looks to us like babies are smiling more when they see pro-social events and frowning more when they see anti-social events. This is pretty subtle and rare in younger babies. Um, and, you know, anecdotal information is not a great way to do science. So in a recent study, we asked whether naive coders who only look at babies' faces and don't know what they're watching whether they can reliably detect differences in infants' emotional reactions. So I'm just going to show you some examples of babies watching our shows <coughs> in order to um, sort of illustrate what, we're, what I'm talking about here. Basically, these babies have each just watched a giving event and a taking event um, in the sort of social case where we think it's honest to goodness helping and hindering. And coders simply watch 10 second or shorter clips of the infant's attention to the stage after the critical giving or taking event occurs. So I'm going to show you two different babies. And if you can try to be a coder here and detect whether a baby is happier in the first thing they see or the second thing they see. Okay, so here's the first baby. So here's the second thing.
Okay, so hopefully everyone agrees that baby number one was happier after the first thing she saw versus the second thing she saw. She also looked longer at the set at the first thing she saw, but um, we're just focusing on her uh, uh, facial expressions in this case. Okay, here is baby number two. Here's the second thing he saw. Okay, so with baby number two, his reactions were pretty different. He um, didn't show any overt smiles, but in fact, he did show on the second event some what we would consider overt frowns. So he did um, quite a bit of brow furrowing, um, or at least quite a bit of brow furrowing for a seven month old. Um, and essentially, this is what coders saw. They saw multiple events that the, each baby watched, and they simply had to guess. Um, which event the baby preferred or which event did they look happier after they watched. Okay, so here's the data. What we found is that babies were significantly more likely, according to coders, to show more positive reactions after helping events than they did after hindering events. Um, as you can see, these effects are not very large. So um, it's better than chance, but not hugely better than chance. And in one of the samples, it was um, not significantly better than chance. In order to try to do a little better at this, what we're currently doing um, is actually using something called facial electromyography, where it, um, you sort of stick painless um, electrical sensors on baby's face um, around their frowning muscles and their smiling muscles. And basically, we're trying to objectively measure um, activation of facial musculature in order to get a sort of uh, better um, read on babies' emotional expressions than what we might be able to read off their face in a few seconds. Okay, um, I'm just going to show you one other kind of study that we do um, in order to try to give uh, um, uh, sort of what I think is a um, more complete picture of what we think infants are doing in these studies. So. There are two parts of each action that I've shown you so far that babies could be evaluating, right? Or at least two parts. One is the outcome, right? The protagonist either gets his goal or doesn't get his goal. And arguably we, we think that getting goals is a good thing and not getting goals is a bad thing. And it's possible that infants are evaluating that when they're thinking that helpers are good and hinderers are not good. On the other hand, infants could be focusing on the intention or the mental states of the helpers and hinderers, right? The helper tried to help and the hinderer tried to harm. Adults, of course, use both of these things when we're evaluating others' actions, but we do tend to privilege intention when they're pitted against each other, right? We think at the end of the day, it's about what you meant to do um, rather than necessarily what you do do. Although in truth, there's both individual and cultural variation to the extent that that's the case. However, children judging pro-social and anti-social others are notoriously terrible at privileging intention over outcomes. So Jean Piaget, one of the most famous developmental psychologists of all time, um, one of his most famous studies showed how kids would say that outcomes are most important when judging good and bad actors. That said, some of the work I've already shown you, as well as hundreds of other studies, suggest that infants themselves focus on intentions rather than outcomes in terms of um, others' actions. And so um, we have asked, what do infants do, right? So when they are evaluating helpers and hinderers, are they focused on the intentions or are they focused on the outcomes? All right, so here's our study about failed helpers versus failed hinderers. So it's just like our box show, except rather than successfully helping this character to open the box, the failed helper is going to try to help and not be able to. Okay, so here the protagonist has a, an intention. He is not able to achieve it, despite the fact that the helper tried to help. Here, the hinderer is going to try to hinder and not be able to. Uh, 
Okay. So here the failed hinderer did jump on the box, tried to prevent the character from opening it, but the character gets it open anyway. Okay. So in this set of studies, we looked at eight month olds and we basically showed them different combinations of characters and asked who they liked more in the usual way with the forced choice. So what we found is that when infants saw characters whose intentions differed, but both caused a good outcome, babies preferred a successful helper who had a good intention to a failed hinderer who had a bad intention. When the outcomes were both bad, so the sort of opposite side of the coin, infants preferred a failed helper with a good intention to a successful hinderer with a bad intention. And indeed, when outcome was directly pitted against intention, like it was in the two shows that I just showed you, infants went with the character with the better intention, despite the fact that he was associated with a worse outcome for the protagonist. What really surprised me in these studies was that when we just looked at outcome, in this case, um, infants chose between two helpers, one who successfully helped and one who failed, or two hinderers, one who successfully hindered and one who failed, infants did not distinguish them, suggesting that they sort of didn't care about differing outcomes, maybe they only cared about intentions. So these results to me suggest that infants are using intention to evaluate helpers and hinderers. They're privileging intention over outcome when they're sort of pitted against each other and that they aren't using outcome even when they could. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the next um, study, but all it is to, to say is that we found a similar pattern of results when we looked at accidents rather than failed attempts. So in these cases, infants preferred someone who intentionally helped over accidentally helped, and they preferred someone who accidentally hindered over someone who intentionally hindered. So basically, um, it's better to hinder if you do so accidentally, but it's better to help if you do so intentionally. I'm not going to show you those shows right now. Okay, so just to wrap up, what does this all mean? Well, infants seem to prefer pro-social to antisocial others from at least three months of age. As they get older, they're particularly likely to prefer those with pro-social mental states rather than those who are simply associated with good outcomes. To me, this suggests that infants have sort of rather remarkable capacities to understand and evaluate characters in their social world from early in their first year of life. Um, but right now there are, you know, just a, so many unanswered questions um, we are currently asking and so many that we hope to ask in the future. We really are just sort of scratching the surface as to what infants know about um, pro-social and antisocial others and how these evaluations work. Um, and that is the work that we are uh, trying to do. Um, I just wanna say thank you for, um, to all of you who have or who may participate in our work with your baby scientists. Um, and um, speaking of that, if you are not currently signed up to participate in our studies, we'd really, really, really love to have you. Um, and if you know of any friends who might be, um, who might have babies or children um, and what might be interested in participating in studies like these, please do pass on the information, especially with COVID where a lot of our recruitment activities are also curtailed in addition to some of our work. Um, but we do have online studies going on all the time and are able to run a few studies in person. So um, we'd really love uh, you to spread the word if you can. In particular, in my own lab um, and run by Rachel, who's um, monitoring the chat together with Sad and Vera, um, we're running a long-term longitudinal study starting from birth. Um, and what we're doing is we're actually trying to look at to what extent these kinds of responses across all of the studies that I showed you from, from studies from birth all the way through infancy and even into early childhood, to what extent infants' responses sort of line up with each other and um, to what extent we might be able to observe individual differences in these responses uh, throughout development. We really don't know the answer to this question yet, um, but we're excited to find out. So if you or anyone you know is expecting a baby, um, we would really love to have you in this project. Okay, um, finally, next month is um, another talk on what babies know, and it's entitled How Do Babies Learn Language? 
And um, this is um, Dr. Jeff Hall, who's both head of the psychology department and a member of the early development research group at UBC. Um, and he'll talk about his work on baby word learning. Okay, um, I would love to answer any and all questions. Awesome, thank you, Kylie. Um, so again, the question and answer window is available if you click the bottom at uh, the button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we have one question so far. Um, when slash how do infants start showing preference for antisocial behavior? <laughs> um, that's a great question. So um, we do actually have some studies where we find that babies do prefer antisocial behavior. Thankfully, it's in slightly predictable situations. So um, I'm afraid I didn't have time to go into this whole other line of research that we do. But basically, we've found that starting as early as four months of age, babies prefer those who are nice in general. So they prefer those who are nice to individuals that babies don't know. Have, have never seen before. So in all the studies I just showed you, the sort of protagonist and the helper hinderer are, are brand new to babies. They've never seen them before. Um, we have found that if they do know the protagonist and they know that the protagonist was previously nice, infants prefer those who help that protagonist. However, if they know that the protagonist was previously mean to someone else, then they prefer someone who hinders that protagonist. Um, so that's just one example of a study where we've observed fairly systematic preferences for antisocial others, um, but we have seen that in a number of different uh, domains um, in the lab. So it is not only that babies prefer helpers, they do sometimes prefer hinderers, um, although we think that it's when they have a fairly good reason for it. We have a COVID-related question as well. It's a great question. If I understood correctly, there's a presumption that babies tend to have a preference for social conditions as they are always surrounded by other humans. How do you think the current pandemic and semi-lockdown situation would impact your study results and how would you account for that as a variable? Yeah, it's such a good question. And it's actually a question that I was totally thinking about as I was building my slides. Um, so, you know, in some ways infants, experiences are very different right now. And in some ways they aren't that different. Um, you know, I'm, you've probably heard people say that like babies and puppies are living their best lives right now, but cats are upset, right? Because their humans are always around. Um, so, you know, in some ways babies are probably seeing fewer different people, but they're probably seeing more of their immediate caregivers than they otherwise might. And so all that is to say, I totally agree with you that there are differences. I think we just won't know for a bit um, whether those differences are going to um, have big impacts, right? Because we don't think that babies are getting less social interaction. We just think they're getting less varied social interaction potentially. Um, and we really won't know for a while. Um, and one of the things we can do is actually look at um, infants who come in, uh, you know, in, in these years versus previously and potentially in the in the after times, should we have them hopefully soon, um, and we can observe whether we see any differences or not. But right now, um, we just don't know. And I think we have reasons to think it might differ or it might not. Awesome. No other questions have come in yet, uh, but I wanted to, oh, here's one. Thank you, <laughs> Helena. Babies in the study seem to be very engaged with the shows. Do babies get any benefit from being exposed to puppet slash character shows from an early age? That's a great question. Um, and I don't, I would love to tell you that I think that these, these particular things are beneficial to babies because I want um, everyone to come in and do our studies. I think um, that at the end of the day, what's beneficial for babies, um, my baby is breaking into my office right now. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, what's beneficial for babies is just to have varied experiences and um, to, you know, be exposed to new things and and uh, um, you know just just learn about different things. Um, and so, if that happens to be puppet shows, then great. If it if it isn't, that's great too. You know, I think it's just about um, varied experience and, and 
anything that they're engaged with is probably good for them. Wonderful. I know you get this question a lot in the lab because obviously, um, you know, the, the data that you're showing us is really about group behavior and group preferences, but often a parent will know, you know, that their individual baby may be preferred the, the antisocial puppet and might ask you, well, what's up with that? So here's a question from Nada. If a baby shows a preference for hindering or antisocial behavior, um, are there actions to help change baby's preference by the surrounding environment? So, I mean, the first thing that I'll say to that is, um, despite the variation that we observe, relative to other kinds of studies in infancy, um, the variation is actually fairly low. <laughs> um, so one of the things that is really sort of tough for us is that we can only get one data point per baby. Um, because we show them these long shows and make them really bored, and then we ask them who they prefer, right? Um, and, you know, adults are messy enough in their moment-to-moment -moment preferences, but babies are sort of an incredibly, we call them noisy bunch, um, just because at any one moment they might be checked in or checked out, they might, you know, babies are right-handed versus left-handed, and so maybe the helpers on their left today, but they're right-handed. Uh, maybe they like blue and not yellow. So there's a million reasons why babies might not prefer the helper in a given, on a given day, in a given situation. That's the reason why we need to study groups of babies and see if they systematic look systematic as a group. Um, that said, we are interested in the individual differences that we observe, and we're interested to know what they mean. Currently, we're not really sure, and that's why we're doing these long-term longitudinal studies in order to try to find that out. So I just want to start answering the question by saying we don't even know if baby's preference, occasional preference for antisocial puppets sort of means anything at all about individual babies. We're trying to find that out. If it did, um, then I would all I would say is, you know, um, just like we would, we would help our babies learn anything they need to learn, right? Um, we, we do a lot of socializing of sort of the right kinds of actions and the wrong kinds of actions. My baby is currently hitting me all the time um, and uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get her to stop doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think, you know, you would go about it in the same way you go about sort of trying to, to shape your baby's behavior um, in any way from not throwing food off their high chair to, to um, sort of um, worrying about not hitting others and things like that. Awesome. This next question is about that longitudinal project that you mentioned, the 500 Babies Project. Um, so it's great that we have Rachel here with us today as well. Uh, mm -hmm. When do we expect the early results of the 500 Babies Research Project to be available? Rachel? Do you want me to, you want me to take this one? Sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, so as you can imagine, um, it takes quite a long time to gather 500 babies um, for for a research project. Um, and also we're being, we're of course faced right now with, with the pandemic. So that's definitely slowed it down a bit, but um, our, we've done some preliminary work um, looking at so exploring um, how our online measures are comparing to our in-person measures since we've had to make the transition into the online format because of the pandemic. So that's really been the first, um, the first task that we've been, uh, that, that we've faced um, is just looking at the comparability between the online and, and in-lab experience and infants responses to the shows in the different formats. Um, so I've been focused on that for the last couple of months, um, and it does seem that there's a lot of overlap and a lot of comparability, which is which is really good. Moving ahead, um, and so we're we're expecting you know the initial results of the actual uh, longitudinal project itself to be still several years um, down the line, um, because we are following babies from from birth right through to age three. So as you can imagine, that's that's going to take a while to. Uh, meet the babies over time um, and, and have them uh, participate in the different activities that we have for them at the different ages and then compile that of course um, into, into a, a data set. So yeah, it's gonna be a while in the future but I'm very excited, very excited about it. And you're still <laughs> looking for participants, yes? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We will still be um, asking for participants for at least another year. So yeah, we are very happy to have anybody who wants to join. We have about 200 families who are participating right now. So yeah. So please tell your friends and family and people on the street. <laughs> yes, we need 300 more babies in order to complete our sample. And you might wonder why we need so many babies um, to do the work that we're doing. And the reason is that um, because you probably saw the sample sizes that I was putting on um, uh, the slides earlier, and there were you know 400 babies on an entire slide, and we found just sort of massively significant effects. So why do we need 500, right? Um, and with a longitudinal project where we have many, many different data points, and we're hoping to be able to statistically look at relationships between data points, both sort of within a baby, within an age group of babies, say like all the newborns, and sort of individual babies over time. Basically, we just need an enormous number of data points in order to be able to observe reliable relationships in our data. Um, and so that's really why we need so many, um, because we want to make sure that the things we're discovering are true and not just sort of spurious um, uh, accidents of small samples. And so we really need um, a really big data set in order to be confident about, about our results. I will say, though, that what we will be able to do is look within age group, so um, at different things. So one of the things we're interested in is how do different responses, say, in the first month of life, relate to each other. So does baby's tendency to track faces over non-faces in the first month of life also relate to how they feel about, say, hearing other babies crying um, in their environment and things like that? And so these are questions that themselves have never been asked in the literature. And so we hope to be answering questions as we go, but the ultimate long-term longitudinal study question will really be many years until, until we're able to say anything there. Um, I have a question here from uh, Tiffany. Has there been any study with babies who prefer pro-social versus anti-social um, actors with EQ? So that's emotional intelligence. That is a great question. Um, we are hoping to answer that question um, again with the 500 Babies Project. Currently, we the, the studies that I showed you thus far, we really just look at babies' preferences and what we do is we change a bunch of things about our studies and see how this affects babies' preferences. So the, the, um, the things that we're measuring are like, well, if we look at the intention part, then they, do babies still show the same kind of preferences? If we look at the outcome part, do they still show the same kind of preferences? Um, as opposed to other things about babies themselves influencing responses. But in the 500 Babies Project, we're measuring not only babies' preference for pro-social actors, but we're also measuring things like their empathy um, and different sort of baby-friendly baby empathy measures. So those are the kinds of data that we're hoping to get, but we, we don't know the answer to that yet at all. But it's a great question. When do infants develop a sense of justice, distinguishing right from wrong actions and labeling them correctly themselves? I mean, <laughs> that is also a great question and, and really one of the questions that really just drives all of the work that we do. Um, so some of the studies that we think maybe hint on this idea are the studies that I mentioned when, um, based on a different question, where we sometimes find that babies prefer those who hinder as long as the characters were hindering someone who was themselves a, a bad guy. Um, so when we think about that work, we think about um, how adults think that some actions deserve punishment. Um, and that was a sort of our baby friendly version of the idea of punishment. So somebody does something bad and then someone treats them either good or treats them bad. And what we found is that babies preferred someone who treats um, a bad guy poorly, essentially. So, that said, there are, are many reasons why babies might have shown that pattern of results. So we can't be sure that it has anything to do with a, an early sense of justice. You mentioned sort of the verbal, um, the verbal things. 
We are also interested in um, these kinds of questions with verbal children, not just infants. Um, and so with kids, you can ask, you know, was that a good thing to do? Was that a bad thing to do? Um, should somebody get in trouble? You know, who deserves to get in trouble? These kinds of questions. And basically we find that as soon as kids are verbal, they are able to answer questions about our puppet shows in the way that you would expect as if they see them as sort of issues of, of right and wrong and, and, um, and true goodness and badness. Um, so, but right now, you know, we see preferences in babies that seem to line up with the verbal judgments that children and adults give, and we can only make inferences about their relationship. We can't be sure that that's what babies are doing when they're responding. All we can say is that it seems fairly consistent with, um, with the idea that these kind of notions might be very early developing. All right, I have another question for Rachel here about the longitudinal study. It's two parts. So the first part is, can a baby outside Vancouver participate in the longitudinal study? Yeah, so um, because, of, because of the way that, that we structured the study, um, although we have had to shift some of our, of our um, studies and activities online, um, we, we can't really have parents participating outside of the Vancouver area because there are, um, some activities that we actually uh, need to eventually meet in person for. Um, and uh, that, that said, you know, there are a lot of activities that will be coming up um, in the future through the Early Development Research Group that are specifically online. Um, so even if, if um, you're not able to participate with your baby online for the longitudinal project, um, there are other really interesting questions being being answered within our early development research group that um, you would be able to participate from, um, from outside of Vancouver. Absolutely. And that goes, I'm sure, in your answer to this next part as well. Can a one-year-old be enrolled at this point? Yeah, yeah, the same thing applies. Basically, um, there's lots of really interesting studies um, that we have as a group available, um, but the longitudinal project in particular, um, we need to, to meet babies um, basically before they're six months old to get those really early measures that we can then, um, as Kylie had mentioned, compare to later measures um, of social development. So yeah, so one-year-old is a little bit old for, for the longitudinal project, but um, there are lots of other activities that, that um, can be done um, with, with your baby. Fantastic. Well, we're right on the money here. It's more or less two o'clock and uh, no more questions have come in. So that's, uh, that's perfect. We're just right on time. Uh, so thank you again, everyone for coming uh, and for asking such fantastic questions. Um, please tell your friends about us. We, um, we need help more than ever during COVID. We are typically um, like historically, we're meeting new moms and dads at the local maternity wards here, and we're not able to do that right now. So we really, we do need participants more than ever. Um, and also, please tell your friends and family about the next talk, uh, March 20th uh, at one o'clock, same time. And um, you'll be able to register for that um, very soon. I don't actually have the link up there yet, sorry. But uh, very soon, you'll be able to register for that. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again. And uh, thank you, Kylie, uh, for this great talk and Rachel and Vera for your help today. Thank you. This was really fun and such great questions. So thanks everyone. <laughs>